Now we must move on to questions to the Minister of Education. I call Mr. Alban McGuinness. Mr. McGuinness. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Number one. As the member knows, the executive budget has been cut by the Westminster Government by £1.5 billion over the last five years. As a direct result of this cut, there is significantly reduced money to spend on frontline services such as education. I have taken every action possible to protect education funding and those frontline services within the Department of Education's remit, ensuring that the priority is keeping teachers and classroom assistants in classrooms. To date, furniture and equipment allocations have been made to five of the 22 uh, school enhancement projects on site. I recognise the issues this raises for the remaining SEP projects, and I have allocated a further £1.8 million for the furniture and equipment need at capital projects on site. Uh, this is expected to fully meet the furniture and equipment requirement of SE projects in 2015-16. DE officials have prepared an in-year bid to the Department of Finance and Personnel to address the shortfalls in funds for, for F&E requirements and other capital projects currently on site. Well, Mr. Alban McGuinness for supplementary. Yes, uh, I thank, the, uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, but is the Minister uh, assuring everybody who has been told uh, that they will be, un uh, that, that, that in fact they will not uh, receive funding for furniture and equipment in schools, is the Minister now saying that that uh, will be remedied by his department? Because the impression given is that they may have new classrooms, but no furniture. Well, what I'm assuring everyone listening is that I'm trying my best, and we're exploring a number of options in terms of how we fund furniture and equipment going into the future. Uh, it depends on the project. For instance, in terms of school enhancement programmes, uh, if there's additional classrooms being provided to schools, then there will certainly be a shortage of furniture. But if we're replacing classrooms or re replacing an existing room, then there will already have been furniture in that room. So we, we have to say, how do we use that furniture going into the future? How do we use that equipment going into the future, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. But uh, as I said, the, the member is aware that uh, there's been £1.5 billion cut off the executive budget. All departments are suffering as a result of that. When we look forward to the next three years and we look at the spending plans of the Conservative government, there's going to be further cuts uh, to our public services, hence the reason why we are in. Uh, the middle of, of the crisis we're in at the minute and why there's talks going on in other places and we wish success to those talks. But this is the reality of reduced budgets, reduced services to frontline services. Call Mr Dominic Bradley for a question. Question number two. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Minister is aware that uh, the reduction in the reduction of funding has come as an unwelcome news to the early years sector. By far the majority of correspondence that I have received on this matter has been from MLAs. I have had one invitation directly from a recipient of the fund. I have answered 51 Assembly questions to this topic on 27 correspondence cases on behalf of the nine of the 153 groups. I have received petitions on this matter from two of the current 153 recipient groups. In my response, I have highlighted once again the cuts to the executive budget as a result of Westminster spending plans. I recognise that some worthy programmes may be impacted as actions are taken to protect those frontline services within the Department's remit. The Early Years Fund was established by the Department of Health in 2004 to help sustain certain early childhood services when PACE II funding ended and has remained available only to those applicants that were in areas of greatest need at that time. A recent review of the fund has highlighted the inequitable nature of the fund for this reason. Importantly, there are children equally deserving of support across the North who cannot benefit from the fund and whose situation must also be considered. It is essential that any funding is allocated in a fair and transparent manner to ensure that those who need it can avail of it most. Call Mr Bradley for supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his uh, answer. Um, Given the fact that each pound invested in early years education saves uh, 18 pounds further on in each individual's life, does the minister not agree that uh, the two million pounds which uh, was invested in this particular initiative was money well spent, considering, as he said, 
Uh, it benefited 153 communities, created 177 jobs, created 2,500 early year places, uh, helped chil 620 children with special Have education and question? needs, and uh, 250 children whose first language is not English. So, does the Minister not, con not consider that this is a very good investment and money well spent? Well, investment in early years is a very good investment, but I contest the member's figures and how he has presented the figures. This fund has not created 177 jobs. In some instances, it sustains jobs. In some instances, it has not created 2,500 preschool places because they are funded from an alternative budget, and there will not be one preschool place lost as a result of the cut to early years fund and I am trying to avoid ending the Early Years Fund, but there will not be 2,500 places lost. And indeed, uh, only this weekend we published the figures for those children who have been successful in gaining a place in preschool, and we are now up in the high 99% of children who have achieved preschool places. So how have we lost 2,500 places? I accept organisations who are losing funding have a right to lobby, and quite rightly lobby for the funding, but I do become concerned when I read and hear alarmist figures that have no substance and that cannot be backed up in any way. I will support early years funding because I believe early years funding is a good way forward. I will not support it on the basis of alarmist figures from anyone. Uh, in relation to early years funding going, to the future, going towards the future, um, members may recall a debate in this chamber, I think it was December of 2014, when members there was a proposal put before members, or a motion put before members, to support classroom activity. It's classroom activity solely because, as I said before, my colleagues in my own party put forward an amendment which covered a wide range of areas, and that was rejected. The Assembly called on me as Minister to invest in the classroom. That's exactly what I did at the end of the budget with very limited resources. You can now not come back to me and say, oh, but by the way, what about early years fund? What about youth services? What about all these other services? Because when it came to the crunch and when it came to the vote in this chamber in December 2014, you all voted for funding to go direct, directly into the classroom. That has an impact upon the Early Years Fund. Call Mr Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for the responses he's given so far. Can I ask the Minister, whatever the scale of funding that's available in terms of um, Early Years, and the Minister has already alluded to this, but could the Minister indicate what practical measures are going to be taken to ensure that uh, applications are treated uh, on an open and accessible way and not simply a question of rolled over to the groups that have, have received it in the past? The member makes a very valid point because this has been a concern and was a concern highlighted in the review which is carried out on the Early Years Fund. That was, in fact, it was a closed fund. If you were in at the start, you stayed in. There was no new applications went into that fund. Now, I am seeking uh, a way forward for the Early Years Fund. I am trying to establish a, bu a budget line for it. I will make a bid uh, to the June monitoring round. I am also examining very, very closely my own budget to see if we can continue the early years fund throughout this year. Now, my preferred option would be to open it up uh, to a new programme. Uh, whoever the, the, the provider of that programme would be would be open to, uh, for further discussion and debate. But I, I want to open it up to a new programme where all relevant groups have an opportunity to make a bid to the programme and then they will be matched against the, the criteria and funding awarded, awarded in an open and transparent way. So I can understand there's frustrations from both sides of this argument in relation to the early years. Those organisations who are losing money currently and those organisations who never got money in the first place. I, I'm trying to open up a new pathway but I have to secure funding first. I call Mr Jim Allister. I'm disappointed by this. Uh, I sense a lack of sympathy from the Minister to the situation which is of his creation in this regard. Surely he realises that there are a number of playgroup and preschool uh, arrangements which are vitally dependent on a significant contribution in order to keep their doors open. To talk about a new fund isn't going to solve problems for people who are facing into a situation in September where they're maybe losing a huge percentage of their funding and are having to lay off staff and even close their doors. Now is the time when this matter might, needs to be addressed urgently. Does the Minister not agree? Well, the, the, the member doesn't sense uh, a lack of sympathy from me. He senses a sense of reality from me. And the member will know that, uh, of course, 
groups affected by funding cuts will lobby. But I, as I've said to previous members, I, do be I am frustrated at times when I hear some of the claims that are broadcast on the airwaves and when I read in the newspapers about the impact this is going to have on preschool places, the impact it's going to have on a wide range of, of, of community infrastructures, which cannot be stacked up when you look at them in detail. Preschool places are funded from a completely different budget line than the early years fund. I stand here today again and I have committed on several times that no, no one will be disadvantaged from obtaining a preschool place because of an end to the early years fund. I want to support community and voluntary organisations out there because they play a vital and important role in our society and in our communities moving forward. But I also have a responsibility, and I am sure the member would agree, that any fund that is created is open to everyone and that it is not a closed fund, as is the case with this fund and that groups who are as equally deserving as those groups who currently achieve funding from the Early Years Fund should also be uh, allowed to at least apply to the fund and then be matched against the criteria moving forward. So I am uh, be accused sometimes of being somewhat blunt in relation to a number of matters, but my responsibility is to uh, achieve funding for, this, for, for Early Years moving forward. I am currently looking at my own budget and I'm making a bid uh, to the June monitoring. And both of those will be explored, and I hope to come out the other end with a successful conclusion to either of those matters. Call Mr. Kathleen Boyle. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Could the Minister just, just outline what funding is available at the minute uh, to deliver these programmes? Well, in relation to uh, the early years fund, which we were discussing, there is still uh, £900,000 between now and the end of August. Uh, to complete the year, I would need an additional £2 million, and that is what I am currently seeking. But in terms of, of, of funding to early years, preschool and other early years organisations, the Department of Education currently spends somewhere in the region of £220 million annually in relation to early years interventions. I think that is quite a significant investment. And a, and, a, and a worthwhile investment from the Department of Education in, re, in relation to early years uh, intervention. So uh, I will emphasise it time and time again. We have the funding for preschool places. We have the funding to keep those organisations or, or those places moving forward. The challenge for myself and indeed perhaps the executive is to find the £2 million which will keep the early years fund running through. And as I will say again, we also have to open that fund up to other bidders as well. Call Mr. Nelson McCausland for a question. Um, question number three. Ligonel Primary School is a control school and such falls under education authority control. It is for the education authority to prioritise their minor works budget allocation in line with priorities I have identified. These priorities include inescapable statutory requirements such as health and safety and obligations under the Disability Discrimination Act, as well as existing contractually committed works. The Department has recently approved a temporary variation to increase Ligonel Primary School's admissions and enrolment numbers. This was granted following confirmation from the school that additional pupils could be catered for within the existing school buildings and that no additional accommodation would be required. Well, Mr. For supplement. Yeah. Um, I think the um, Minister will be aware of the history of this situation whereby back in the 1980s, at the height of the Troubles, um, several classrooms and toilet and storage facilities were separated out from the rest of the building so that uh, a nearby nursery school could be accommodated within the suite of buildings. We are now in a position where this school is able to just about bring children in but is not able to meet the requirements that you would normally expect for seven class provision over the seven years. And could I ask that he would at least uh, inquire as to what might be done by the Education Authority in regard to the provision of one mobile classroom which would ensure that they were able to meet the full requirements of the seven classes and no, would therefore be no need for composite classes. I am more than happy to raise the matter with the Education Authority, but I would also suggest, and perhaps the members have already uh, done this, raise the matter himself with the Education Authority, uh, because they also have a responsibility to be open and frank with elected representatives as much as they do with the Minister. But I am more than happy to raise the matter with the Education Authority and report back to the member uh, in relation to Legal Aid Primary School. 
Ms. Michaela Boyle. Margaret um, Ken Collier, can I thank the Minister for his response to that question? And now, given that it, we are in June and there are many schools that are making plans for the September intake uh, who find themselves in the same position as uh, the Ligonil School, can I ask the Minister just to expand on what work DE uh, is doing with the Education Authority to ensure that schools uh, have a good line of communication with the Education Authority to um, uh, ensure that steps will be taken, that schools will have that information, whether they're going to be provided with additional classroom accommodation come September, Gormaga? Well, as I said in the original answer to Mr McCausland, it's, it's a matter for the Education Authority to prioritise their minor work scheme. We have set out priorities. And it's, the minor works funding this year ha has reduced dramatically uh, for all the reasons I've already rehearsed during this question time. And there is significant pressures in relation to minor works programmes moving forward. And the Education Authority is having to prioritise in relation to disability discrimination, health and safety and other statutory obligations. But in relation to communication between the Education Authority and schools, I think it is vital that there's open and clear communications between both of those bodies. Uh, schools quite rightly need to know what their accommodation is going to be uh, in September, which will come across very, very quickly. And I am more than happy to raise uh, concerns raised by members in the Chamber with the Education Authority, but I do urge members also to contact the Education Authority directly. As I said again to Mr McCausland, they have a duty to be open, frank and transparent with elected representatives as well. Mr Steve Mutry for question. Question number four, Deputy Speaker. Uh, legislation requires that all preschool pre settings give priority to children from socially disadvantaged backgrounds. Preschool settings are responsible for setting any subsequent criteria themselves. Priority is given to children from socially disadvantaged circumstances in preschool admissions process because research has shown that they experience more difficulty at school than any other children. This is part of a wider effort to tackle educational underachievement. Learning to learn, a framework for early years education and learning, includes an action to implement remaining actions from the review of preschool admissions, including one to examine the definition of socially disadvantaged circumstances, with a view to ensuring the relevant criteria are up to date and indeed ex expanded if need be. Uh, I also want to examine the criteria to ensure that they do not disadvantage low-paid working parents. I have asked my officials to consider the issue associated with ex uh, extending the priority criterion. Minister, for supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for at least part of his response. But I do remain unconvinced that the Minister realises the depth of feeling in the ground concerning the criteria that is enforced upon schools, leaving working families disadvantaged over those in benefits. Can the Minister confirm that, given the increase in the birth rate and on already overstretched provision, that he will consider extending provision that currently operates on a part time basis? especially in places like Waringstown, where there is considerable oversubscription? Well, a number of points the members raised. Research shows us, and I, regardless of, of, of the, the, the parents' benefits, for whatever reason, my job is to look after the children in relation to these matters. And children from socially disadvantaged backgrounds are at a greater disadvantage starting schools than those who are not. That's, that's evidence-based statement. If we make interventions, and there's a debate at the earlier part of the questions around early interventions, early years, etc. If we make an early intervention at that stage, then we ensure that the child has uh, a greater opportunity to succeed in education, and we also save money further on down the line. Now, I do accept there's an argument from those families in relation who are on low paid, who are, are facing financial challenges themselves, who are out working, trying to. Uh, make ends meet. I do accept there is, there, there is a further responsibility in my department to assist those families as well. And as I have said, I am asking my officials to look as to how we broaden the social disadvantage criterion. It was caught up in the welfare debate, um, but I think we can move it on either in conjunction with the welfare debate or separate from the welfare debate. I think it is now time uh, to move that on. In relation to part-time, full-time provision, Again, evidence-based research shows us that there is 
uh, no significant difference between providing part-time provision for a child or full-time provision for a child. Now, ideally, I would like to provide up to four hours for all children. The finances are not there currently to do it, but I am satisfied that the provision we are providing under part-time is good for the child's uh, development. Call Mr. Ian Milne. Well, uh, has the Minister any intentions to widen even further uh, the prioritisation criteria for preschool uh, admissions to the working poor? Well, uh, Mr. Mutri, I, I do intend to try and move this forward. It is, as I said, tied up in the welfare uh, debate. And it may be tied up in the welfare debate further, because as, as I'm speaking, I'm also thinking that the Conservative government is, may well do away with a number of benefit entitlements, and we are concerned about the future family tax credits, etc., and how what band with those family tax credits are in. So the, 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 the goalposts may continually change on us in relation to this, but I do want to assist families who are working, low-income families who are out working, and the, uh, who also quite rightly recognise there's a disadvantage to their children as well in this. But it's also worth noting as well that they say social criterion only operates for 25% of children who apply uh, to preschool places. And I'm also in the position to say that over 99% of children who applied for preschool provision this year have been provided with preschool provision this year. So no one at the end of the day has been left out because of the social disadvantage clause. It does cause uh, and I, I'm an elected representative for an area myself, and I know the heat it can cause around some of these issues, but I believe that the principles of the policy are right. I believe the principles of the policy are making a difference to our educational achievement, but I do recognise there is an argument to widen the criteria. Well, Mr. Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thanks, Minister, for your answers thus far. Minister, given that the sustainable schools policy provides guidelines in terms of uh, travel time to school that primary sc children shouldn't travel more than 30 minutes and post primary shouldn't travel more than 45 minutes. Has he any will he, will he provide some guidance for um, pre preschool children in terms of travel time? As the member is aware, there is no set uh, criteria in terms of travel time for preschool children, but we certainly wouldn't want it to be above that set out in terms for primary school children. And we try to provide services as close to the family home as possible, though that is not always possible. And I, I suspect the member's question is, is maybe also triggered by the latter parents receive if they're not successful in getting a place. And it lists the entire list of preschool providers in a geographical area. Some of them may be 30, 40, 50 miles away. There is no suggestion in the distribution of that letter that parents should consider sending their children that far. It is a generic letter sent out from uh, the, the regional offices of the Education Authority to parents setting out a list, and every parent will receive the same, though I can understand why it causes some concern and at times anger with, among parents when they receive it. But it could be a more expensive and logistical nightmare to break it down into even smaller geographical areas as well. So we also have to think of those matters as well. Mr. Trevor Lunn. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The, the Minister has rightly highlighted twice now that over 99% of applications have been satisfied this year for preschool places. Uh, does he have any concerns about the balance between the statutory and the non-statutory sectors, and in the long term, perhaps the need to, as funds allow, uh, re redress that balance in favour of the statutory sector? This has been an ongoing debate in education for many years as to the value of each of the sectors who provide preschool education. Um, but I would just caution the member in regard to some of these matters because the first or second question I was asked today was about the Early Years Fund. That Early Years Fund goes into uh, community and voluntary sector. It, it allows community and voluntary sectors to provide preschool places, early years intervention, but it also allows them to be sustainable and provide many, many other services in a community. So I would caution against removing preschool places in the community and voluntary sector in favour of the statutory sector for a variety of reasons, one including that we will decimate the community and voluntary sector's funding. But the ETI reports show us that there has been a constant improvement uh, in the delivery of, of preschool education in the community and voluntary sector, and we will continue to uh, ensure that continues to rise. I have invested more and more money. Uh, I, I can't remember the exact percentage, but over this last number of years, it has it has rose quite considerably in terms of the amount of money I have invested in preschool settings in the community and voluntary sector, allowing them to invest uh, in the setting to allow them to provide more and more 
curricular activity for the children involved and to allow them to provide training to their staff as well and, and, and decent wages so they attract the right staff. So all those things are at play, but it's not as simple, and I'm sure the member, there has been some, even during my time at the Education Committee, there was some quite lively debates between the various sectors around this matter, and I have no doubt that debate will continue. Call Mr David McNary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Going back to um, Mr. Rogers' uh, uh, answer and the minister's, or sorry, his question and the minister's answer. Um, this idea of the generic letter and the minister quite rightly identifying uh, parental anger uh, when that generic letter is received and there's this geographic list of where they can go. Uh, on the basis that that has, and it certainly has by my constituents, been misinterpreted and provoked that anger, would the minister uh, be in a position uh, in future that such a letter would be worded uh, more carefully and more appropriately uh, not to cause any consternation to parents. And perhaps the message that he's actually said here today in the House, I think is, uh, is something that uh, the parents uh, and the schools would like to hear, and perhaps his own uh, press office might do something about I think uh, we've getting that answer just right. The question, and go Mr. Along with that? Thank Minister. Well, uh, yes. Uh, I find myself in a strange position of agreeing with you, uh, but I think you have a point, and it is about communication, it is about the use of language, it is about information to parents, to elected representatives, uh, to the media, etc., around these matters. And I have raised it during the review, which was a number of years ago, it was one of the areas I raised uh, with the then education boards around the use of a generic letter. I'm more than happy to return to the education authority with that and work with them in an attempt to I don't think there's an opportunity, and I'm not ruling out any options, I don't think there's an opportunity to break it down into tighter geographical areas because logistically I think it will be quite difficult, but I do believe there's an opportunity to reward the letter in a way which sets out to parents exactly what is meant and the intent of the letter as well. I call Mr David Michael Veen. Uh, question number five, Mr Deputy Speaker. The executive, as I've said, the executive's budget has been reduced by the Westminster government by £1.5 million over the last years. I have taken every action possible to track my Department of Education funding. However, it is simply not possible to track every element of it. I have endeavoured to minimise the impact as far as possible by ensuring that all groups that currently benefit from the early years fund will continue to receive funding uh, to the end of the academic year, the 31st of August 2015. I have committed to review my budget and any other opportunity for funding to establish if a fund can be established for the early years sector, which would be open to all applicants, not just current recipients, and be aligned to priorities of DE. I fully recognise the importance of this fund, and as I've said in relation to uh, other members who have asked questions, over 11 per cent of the entire DE budget is dedicated to early years, some in the region of £220 million. This includes fully funded early years programmes identified funding for nursery schools, nursery units of primary schools and foundation students. It also includes other relevant expenditure, expenditure such as that allocated to special educational needs, early years capacity building and extended schools funding. Well, Mr. Michael Veen for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. I appreciate the time constraints. Um, the Minister, I'm sure, would agree with me that there is no more vulnerable group in society that needs protecting than that of children of, of a preschool age. Um, therefore, particularly in rural areas, which are going to be particularly hard hit um, by the reduction in funding, what assistance is his department going to give such groups in order to help them to source funding from other sources? Well, uh Will be, well, my first priority is to try and achieve funding to continue through this academic year up till August the 31st. That's my first priority. I am concerned we're in relation to isolated, particularly isolated rural communities, that we do not lose uh, important community assets in those communities through the loss of the early years fund. I'm also conscious of that and I'll continue to monitor that situation. Um, if I'm not successful and I I have not admitted defeat on this matter yet, but if I'm not successful in identifying the £2 million within my own budget or achieving the funding bid to the executive, we will work very closely with those organisations that are currently funded to signpost them to other funding organisations. We can take one very brief question from Mr Chris Little. Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for his answer. And I, I, I'm sure every MLA recognises that we have to incur budgetary reductions, but can I ask how you can justify a 100% uh, reduction to the early years fund? Um, because I, I'm in an area now where chipping away a few hundred thousand here and a few hundred thousand there it doesn't work anymore. 
Um, and, uh, the member will, as he said, appreciate that all budgets are under severe financial pressure, but when I'm coming to saving tens of millions of pounds, I, I'm now at a point where, I, I, in the past, I was able to take a percentage away from a budget line. I'm now at the point where I have to end budget lines to make the savings required. And it's far from satisfactory to me, uh, or to, I'm sure to anyone in the House, but that's the reality of the current financial situation. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. Sean Rogers. Mr. Rogers. But the Minister has, is seeking extra funding for early years as part of the June monitoring round. Could I ask him, in terms of STEM sentinels, is he putting a similar bid in there? Uh, no. Um, I have to be realistic in terms of this is the June monitoring round, and the, the ability to obtain money from this monitoring round has been traditionally that it is a very limited opportunity. I have had to prioritise my bids. I have made bids which I believe maybe possibly will are important to the executive, are important to the House, and are based on uh, the lobbying which I have received over this period of time. An early years fund has been top of that list, so I have included the early years fund. I have not included Sentinel. It doesn't mean it's not important. It means that I'm being re realistic in terms of what funding I can achieve. Mr. Rogers, for supplement. Can I thank the Minister for his answer, and although I'm very disappointed in that because um, STEM is, 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 is necessary in terms of enriching our, our students' learning and also in terms of our economy. But has he any plans, in, maybe in future rounds, that he would seek extra funding for STEM sentinels? Keep my options open on, on, uh, for future funding rounds, but the member is also aware that there is still funding going into STEM and sentinels funding. You know, it still has a budget line. It is still able to carry out uh, very good work in that area. Um, so it's still operational, and I, I will keep my options open going into future monitoring rights. Mr. Gary Middleton for a topical question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, could the Minister provide an update on what discussions, if any, are taking place in relation to the future use of the Foyle College and Ebrington Primary School uh, sites for, uh, after the completion of their new build? Um, well, uh, it's, it's a matter between. Uh, the Foyle College, and then also in relation to the Education Authority, who, who would be managers of the Abrington School site, as to what the future usage of it is. I am aware there are suggestions uh, in the Derry area as to what the future use of that school and school site should be, and uh, it's a matter for discussion between the proposers and uh, the, the relevant ownership authorities in, in that case. Call Mr. Middleton for a supplementary. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, would the Minister agree that uh, it is important that these uh, sites are of use to the local communities, and will he uh, work with uh, the relevant uh, authorities to ensure that uh, these sites are of benefit to the local area and that they don't uh, be left in dereliction? Well, I am more than happy to uh, work with uh, the relevant authorities in regards to this matter. And um, in fairness to, to himself and other representatives in Derry, you, you always have a plan and uh, a call for what should happen next, and I think that's, it's a credit to you all. I know there is some discussion around educational opportunities for the site, perhaps uh, from the further and higher education sector, which would seem interesting and exciting uh, moving forward. But I, I'm, I, I don't want to see sites lying derelict anywhere. I want to see investment. I want to see growth. I want to see jobs being created, they want to see community infrastructure being strengthened, and the way to do that is the use of, of former, for want of a better term, government sites, uh, and I appreciate FOIL is under the ownership of, of trustees, etc., but I am more than happy to work with anyone who has ambitious plans for moving forward. Mr Joe Byrne for a topical question. Speaker, can I ask the Minister, what is the situation regards capital new build programmes for amalgamated schools, in particular, I want to mention the amalgamation of two primary schools, Noma Towns and Column Kills, Brook Street, and the Loretta Primary School, Brookman Road, Oma. Uh, the, the member will appreciate I am not in a position to comment on the individual schools. Um, uh, during an earlier debate in relation to area planning, uh, one of the recommendations coming from the committee's report is that uh, investment should be aligned to area planning, uh, which my department has already uh, carries out. And that where there is amalgamations or, or development proposals which have come to conclusion and are being implemented, that capital should be aligned to that. We are doing our best 
uh, in regards to that in the department. But the member will also be aware that the Department of Education has taken a 20% cut to its capital funding this year, which is proving difficult for the delivery of the full scope of projects uh, we hope to have had on the ground either in this year or next year. Burn for supplement. Thank the Minister for the answer. Would the Minister accept, however, in a situation where we have an amalgamation of two primary schools on two different sites, that it does pose particular problems for the management and for the principal of those schools, and should there be a priority given to those particular situations? Well, uh, the general principle, I, I would agree that it, it provides additional hurdles uh, for the principal and the senior management team of any school. Uh, but I will also advise the member that in terms of scoring for capital pro projects, that uh, scoring for, there is a score for amalgamation. amalgamation. So if a school has amalgamated, it will score additional points in relation to the, the building policy moving forward. So the, the school and the amalgamation is recognised as part of the capital programme going forward. And I am speaking in general terms at, the, at this stage. I, don't have, have, I do not have enough funding to move all projects forward uh, going into the future, but I will continue to try and secure funding. Mr. Dominic Bradley for a topical question. Can I ask the Minister um, how he views situations in which uh, local post primary schools are hugely oversubscribed and have to turn away local pupils who live in the local area, attend local feeder primary schools, are in the top categories of the admissions criteria, and whose families? have been associated with the school for generations? Well, th this is one of the, the pillars of area planning, and there was a quite a, a, a good debate, apart from sections of it, I have to say, earlier on in the day around area planning, and the committee report uh, is worth very, very careful consideration by all members involved. We have to ensure we have an area plan in place which recognises population shifts and growths and decline and ensuring that our, that our schools, both primary and post-primary, are able to adapt to that going into the future. But there, there are certain areas where, in my view, area planning should be f much further advanced than they currently are, and the managing authority should have in place plans uh, which would respond to variations in population growth at any time. Bradley, for supplement. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer here. But in the absence of area plans, in such cases where there is a proven need for extra places, will the Minister look at other possibilities which will fulfil the need in the meantime? I will and I have. Uh, and it's, the, the process is called temporary variations. Um, and there will be instances where it is the appropriate method to move forward, and there will be other instances where it will not be the appropriate method to move forward. But it doesn't negate the responsibility on managing authorities uh, to bring forward area plans which meets the need of an area moving forward. Question five was withdrawn. I call Mr. Pat Sheehan. Uh, could the Minister outline what is being done to standardise SEND provision throughout the Education Authority area? Um, the Education Authority is currently working to develop a regional approach to the delivery of the current SEND framework. The, the purpose of this regionalisation excuse me, <coughs> the purpose of this regionalisation is to ensure equity of access for all children to special educational needs services and to promote a more cohesive and harmonised approach to supporting some of our most vulnerable children across all of the Education Authority regions. The provisions in the Special Educational Needs and Disability Bill and Revised SANE Regulations and Statutory Code of Practice will provide a rounded and considered package of measures that will contribute to a more responsive and less bureaucratic framework moving forward. Mr. Sheehan for supplementary. Could the Minister tell us how, how this Education Authority regionalisation along with the current SEND legislation, impact on SEND provision uh, and the statement and process? Um, one of the, the rationales for bringing forward the Education Authority legislation initially, and indeed one of the very strong arguments for bringing forward uh, the, the Education Authority Bill 
was to ensure that we had harmonisation of services across all regions. And one area of concern was the provision of same services, where one board area might provide different services than one next door, and children literally uh, half a mile apart were receiving different services. So there is an opportunity now for the, the authority to bring forward plans for a regional service, which, uh, which meets the needs of all the young people moving forward. The SAN bill is about modernising um, the statementing process. It's not about the deletion of rights or the removal of rights of any of our children or, or their parents. And it's about strengthening uh, the legislative basis upon how we move forward and indeed speeding up the statementing process, which is very often a matter of frustration for parents. And I'm sure all elected representatives in the chamber have experiences of working on behalf of parents in relation to statementing processes and the difficulties you have in approaching that. So the same legislation is about modernising uh, what is a very convoluted and complicated process. for topical question. Speaker, uh, I'm sure the Minister is aware of the current protests happening on Donegal Road. Uh, this is in relation to the proposed amalgamation of the three schools as Donegal Road, uh, Fain Street, and Blyfield Primary School. Would the Minister agree with me that this proposal does not have local support and, in fact, has caused a lot of uncertainties uh, in, uh, with parents and teachers? Is this premature uh, decision going to you know, happen? I'm not in a position to comment on an individual proposal, uh, especially one that is in a pre-consultation mode uh, with the Education Authority and the local community. Uh, I would encourage everyone who has an opinion on this to make it known to the Education Authority and to keep focused in their minds uh, that education delivery is not about buildings. It's about the provision of good education for all our young people. So uh, I, I'm, I don't mean this in a disrespectful way to anybody involved in, in any of the protests. I'm not so interested in saving our schools as I am interested in saving our education. For supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I think the problem with this minister is, is the lack of a site and lack of certainties about you know, when and where the school is going to, to happen and where it is going to be. Would the minister consider putting forward a firm proposal of where the school is going to be before he, announce, he, he decides to close all the three schools? to do so. It will be the job of the Education Authority uh, to firstly bring forward a development proposal if they wish to do so. I will then go into a two-month consultation period where I'm more than happy to meet with elected representatives, parents and representative groups to discuss the proposal uh, and moving forward. But uh, in, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I don't wish to go into the detail of, of any development proposal that may come forward to me in relation to this matter, but the general principle is that it's up to the Education Authority or the Managing Authority to bring the proposal forward. And if they've, it's not the job of the development proposal to develop a site. That, that's separate again. It will be a matter for the Education Authority to identify a site of any future proposed amalgamated school going into the future. So they're two separate issues, joint issues, but two separate issues in terms of how the decision-making process works out. Well, Mr. Fram, we can for topical. A last count, Kohler. Uh, could the, on Thursday last, the department released the figures and the number of pupils achieving GCSEs. Uh, can the minister please outline the, the key points uh, from this report? Well, uh, it makes for welcome reading, I have to say. We see a continued increase in our young people who are achieving five good GCSEs, A to C, or equivalent, including English and Maths. We're now at 63.5% of our young people leaving school. That's almost five percentage points up on the last report from a couple of years ago. So the, the intense focus on uh, raising standards is paying off, both from the initial investment in early years, right through primary school and into post-primary school, the hard work of teachers, parents, pupils, communities and community leaders in raising the focus around the need for educational improvement is beginning to show dividends for our young people. Mr McCann for a supplementary. Thank you. Uh, last count, Kula. Um, I say the, no, the number of pupils achieving GCSEs at NC and 2009-10 was 71.9 per cent, uh, which has increased uh, to 78.6 per cent in 1314. This is obviously to be welcome, but can the Minister outline how his department intends to continue this upward tra trajectory? Uh, as I outlined, this is a multi 
multi-agency approach in almost when I use the term agencies advisingly because um, you see in turn, uh, we debated this much last year when we were making changes to the, the, the common funding formula. If a child is from a socially deprived background, then it, the evidence shows it's less likely to do well in education. So we have to invest in jobs, we have to invest in community infrastructure, we have to invest in families, and we have to ensure that people are given an opportunity to be everything they can be from the family home. When they go in through the school gates, we have to ensure uh, that, that our teachers are motivated and focused, which thankfully the vast, vast majority of them are, that there's a strong board of governors, there's strong leadership in the school, and the school has close links with the community, and the community is playing its part. Because if any one of those pillars fall down, then the child is automatically disadvantaged. So, yes, the Department of Education will continue to focus both inside the school gates and outside the school gates, but we have to ensure that the family and the community is supported as well if we want to see continued educational improvement for our young people. Members, time is up. Uh, you may take your ease while we change the table.